Okay, today I get a chance to have a long discussion with someone I've known for a while, but this is kind of the most in-depth conversation we're going to have, so it's, I'm looking forward to it. Her name is Cassie Terkesian, and she is got her she has got her fingers in all kinds of media art and uh, and music and art and video projects. I'm going to let her explain it. But um, I actually had an opportunity to work with her uh, related to the Node for for Max project from the Max 8 release. And I was blown away by the not only the skill, but the breadth of knowledge that she had in the whole area. So I thought it would be fantastic for us to have a chat. So with that, I will shut my mouth and, and talk to Cassie. Hey, Cassie, how's it going? Good. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Um, so <laughs> to be honest... Um, I'm actually here like with two hands holding up my microphone because my oh, mic boom yeah. fell apart. So that's what my <laughs> life's looking like this morning. So I'm hoping you're going to make it great. all better. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too. All right. So why don't we start off by having you talk a little bit about all the different things you do. Okay. I think, I think the best place to start is maybe where I'm at right now and then maybe go backwards and jump around a little bit. So right now I have a couple main things that I'm working on. So I work part-time as an engineer at Cycling 74 and um, I've focused mostly on like JavaScript and, and web technologies. So that's meant like working on mirror web and also working on node for max. Mm -hmm. And I also work part time with, the, with this um, nonprofit called the processing foundation, which is kind of the, the maintainer or organizer of these tools called processing and p5.js. And there's a Python version processing.py I lead one of their open source projects. It's called the P5 Web Editor, and it's an online platform that's de designed to be like other, similar to other kind of in-browser code editors like CodePen or Glitch.com, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's focused on making P5 sketches and focused on being just like simple and easy to use and, and not a ton of configuration and, and all that kind of stuff. And I've been leading that project for almost three years now, which is crazy. <laughs> and I also do a lot of workshops and I recently started teaching this past fall. I taught a like an intro to P5 class at the an NYU program called Interactive Telecommunications Program, or ITP. Um, and it's a grad program about uh, using, I guess, like using programming as a medium for art is, is kind of the summary I always use. So yeah, that's that's the most recent, recent things in, in my life. <laughs> well, that is a, a fair number of recent things, though. Yes. I, I think it's interesting that you're involved in two of the real powerhouses of the media art world, working on Max and working on uh, working with uh, the Processing Foundation. Let's talk a little bit, just before we get into your background, which is something yeah. I always do, I want to talk a little bit more about how you manage doing all these kinds, all these different things. Because it, on one hand, it sounds like they're all related. They're all kind of tying in web technology to media art. But on the other hand, the kind of programming that is, is typical for a Max user is very different from the kind of programming that a processing person's going to do. And in the being in the developer loop on those is very different from teaching end users. So what for you is like the common thread through all of those? I think the common thread is, I, th I think there's kind of like two spaces for this. So I think for me, as like an engineer programmer, I don't feel like super strongly about like what tools I'm using, like whether I'm writing like C or JavaScript or whatever, like I, I'm extremely practical. I'm just kind of like whatever I need to learn to like get this thing done. I don't really care what it is. And so I think, I think that makes it easier to just like figure out what I need to do and like 
jump into that. And I think I think on the other side, it's really nice being in this constant feedback loop where it's like I work on these tools and then by like teaching and doing workshops and being in this community, I like see what newer people are doing and how they're interacting with these tools and then also like using them myself and also also playing around with that. So it's kind of it's kind of like being in the community and also being the type of engineer or like technical person that I am. Mm hmm. Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. The, the feedback loop thing is kind of powerful, but especially if uh, teaching is part of that loop structure, <laughs> it means that you have to you have to engage on it with beginners, which a lot of times is a different experience than just getting feedback from users, right? Totally, it's very it's very different. It's incredibly revealing the the assumptions that you make. You right. know. Right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that um, I am always curious about is anytime I get somebody who has um, who has facility with code, but also looking at your website, I see that you like play in a band and you have a pretty, you know, pretty active mm -hmm. personal art, art world as well. Mm -hmm. I'm always curious about people's backgrounds because frankly, it's only in the last few years that the idea of being a coded coding creative has really become mainstream in any shape, way, shape, or form at all, right? So I'm wondering yeah. what it is, how you cracked that door open for yourself, what that looked like, and you know, what were the influences that got you where you are? Yeah, it's been like an interesting journey for me. I think I think I kind of started being interested in like music and, and art and like the internet as a and like programming as a fun thing so the first time I ever interacted with programming was on this website called Neopets have you heard of it yes way back when yeah, so as a young child and teenager, I was super into this website. Okay. And, you know, that's it like it does all all kinds of things. Like you can play games on it, you raise your pet, you can mm -hmm. paint them or whatever. But there's this one part of it where you can um customize certain parts of your your persona on this. Like you can uh customize your pet pages and make like a landing page for them or like you can make a custom shop page and so you know the way that you do that is using html and css so that was the first time i had started interacting with these things and you know it was just like oh like this is so cool like i can i can like put this page up on the internet and didn't really realize that i was doing programming you know right sure <laughs> and then i think i think that that was also part of this this era of a, a bunch of different websites like that. And as a young teenager, when I had a MySpace, I did the same thing. I like really wanted to customize it and like put a song up and make it make it uh, representative of me. But I think within that, I never really thought of myself as as someone who knew about computers at all. You know, and as a as a teenager, I. I like played music, I played piano, and I was into just like the art classes at my high school. I loved that. And um, it was only really when I got to undergrad that I decided to like try try it out. And I just I just like totally jumped into doing engineering just because I I was just interested in that way of thinking and really wanted to know how computers worked. And it took me a really long time to connect these two worlds. They felt s separate for a long time. When I was learning programming as a as an undergrad, we would do these assignments where I learned Java and we would do assignments where we would write command line tools. It's like you input things right. to it, you get some output. And for me, it was this completely new way of interacting with my computer. It totally blew my mind that like you could interact in this way. And I, I saw how powerful it was. And then when I tried to 
show my friends what I was doing. You know, I, I'd like show this program that just like printed out numbers <laughs> and things and they'd be like, I like really don't understand what you're doing. Right. <laughs> and like why this is like meaningful at all. And so it like took me a really long time to connect these worlds. And I think when I discovered tools like processing and like pure data and max, I saw it like showed me how these worlds are connected and it, it like showed me that there's a space for interacting with programming and, and your computer. That's not, um, that's not like you need to be a software developer or whatever that, you know, these, these can be tools that you like any, anyone can use. Sure. So what was like your first dive into what, what you would now consider like artistic programming? I mean, I, I understand the the way you get jazzed up by getting a command line programming working, but at what point <laughs> did you do something that like you either performed with or that represented an art piece or something like that? What was, when was that, when did you kind of like jump over that divide? So I took a class in undergrad. I think I took it like literally my last semester. It was a computer music class and in it, we used pure data. That to me was amazing. It like really, you know, it, it was a moment to like, to learn it and, um, you know, perform with it and connect all these worlds. I mean, the, the other world it connected for me, like I, I studied electrical engineering in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. So as, as part of that, I did a lot of like digital signal processing. So for me, I, I learned like the math background of all of these you know, like signal processing and then learning something like pure data, I was like, oh, like this is the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> you know, and so it, it was like really this moment of all these things tying together. And I, I loved that. And then I think from <clears throat> from then, it really took a while for me to figure out how to make it part of my my world because I only I only knew how to interact with being a being a developer as like a professional developer and I thought this was like some weird world that like people just did for fun you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it is for fun but it was like a weird a weird tiny world that's like hard to you know it's hard to break into so I think you know after after graduation it, it took a, it took a few years to, to figure out how to be there well, th it's curious to say that, though, because on, on one hand, it is kind of a weird and isolated world. But on the other hand, so much of the world of that world is based on open source development, mm -hmm. which can be, not always, but can be very open and inviting for developers to get involved in the community. Is that is that how you dove in initially? kind of bringing your engineer skills or or did you have like commercial jobs that you were I mean do you work for somebody first yeah I mean I I worked as a the traditional software developer for oh, okay for a little while eventually eventually it decided to take take the leap and like shift shift into working on working on creative tools and like you know, working, working more with these tools. But I think, I think it's been like, it's been a really slow process, just kind of like picking one thing up and, and seeing what happens with it. I originally, I originally got involved with Processing Foundation. I mean, ba basically, I had, I had learned about I'd learned about processing and, and known about it for a few years and learned about P5 and um, which is which is a project started by this artist Lauren McCarthy, who's on who's on the board at Processing Foundation, and that project was really exciting to me because it was the only open source project that I knew that was that was started by a woman, mm -hmm. and it that to me was super exciting, and I was like, wow, like I didn't know this was was like literally possible for open source. For for me, open source had always been been kind of like techie nerdy tools it was like okay we all work on the like the 
GCC, like the GNU right, right. C compiler or yeah. whatever. Yum. Or, They're so fun. <laughs> right. Like that's what I thought. Or it was like the, um, that's another, the open source projects new, or like the boost C++ right. library, whatever. Right, right. So that was what I knew. So seeing, seeing, and you know, even processing was open source that it was, it was like a weird, it was still, you know, founded by two men. And so seeing that Lauren was working on this, it like really blew my mind. And I wanted to, I wanted to be involved. So I applied, they have a fellowship program and I, I applied for it and I didn't get it, but then had emailed one of the other board members, Dan Schiffman had been like, I like really love the foundation and, and I want to be involved <laughs> and somehow. And then we got to talking about working on the the web editor and like me starting it and then figuring out funding and, and all that. So kind of with, with an olive branch from them got, got started with that. Yeah. Began yeah. my open source journey. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting because um, first of all, uh, as a good indicator for the listeners, begging sometimes helps, right? <laughs> or, or maybe maybe the right phrase is being persistent, but uh, yeah. nevertheless, you know, staying, staying at it and really, foc- you know, finding the thing you want to focus on s- sounds like it really, really super much did work for you. Totally. Yeah. And yeah, just saying I, I like really wanted, really wanted to be involved. Um, right. Now that you're like a project lead of one of the segments, what do you do to make uh, to make that environment open for the people that want to work with you? Um, I try to. <laughs> Not an easy question, I guess. No, it's right. a hard question. I'm. It's it's really hard. It's really hard, and I think I think I'm always getting better at it. I think one thing that seems like really simple but it's like surprisingly people don't do is just like being friendly on github like people are not friendly (laughs) like being being nice on github and you know being open to people making i guess also being open to people making mistakes Mm -hmm. i've seen i've seen on other projects where for example someone will submit a pull request and it'll be like oh this doesn't work closing you know and rather than taking that that attitude i try to encourage people to post whatever whatever they have and like work with them them to figure out a solution yeah i think one thing is just trying to be open on github and be friendly try to work on the documentation as as much as i can which is always a always a work in process right i've done some i've done some mentorship programs like i've done um google summer of code so i've had some mentees through that well it's interesting though that you kind of talk about this cultural thing uh with how people act on github and you know i i actually have had a similar experience with with some other projects i've been involved in and i think that one of the one of the issues that might be at play is that for a lot of people github is a thing that they are active in both in their working lives and in their creative lives and unfortunately yeah. sometimes when they're working on their creative lives or their social life they're still bringing this work life attitude which is like you cost me time you cost me money that pisses me off kind of a thing right totally it it really ends up putting up a barrier for i mean i know even in things that i've been involved with when when that attitude comes across it's like I don't know why I in- involve myself with this community. This just makes it too hard, <laughs> right? This makes it, it makes it yeah. unfun and I should go for a bike ride instead, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> Life is too short to be mean. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I agree. I agree. But, you know, on the other end, I guess I have been in situations where, I've been trying, you know, I've been trying to do something and have been frustrated by, frustrated by some bug that was introduced by an update or whatever. And I can understand being frustrated, but it seems like there's a real difference between frustration and anger. And I, and it seems like we see an awful lot of anger for some reason. (laughs) 
Yeah. I think, I think there's also a disconnect between, you know, realizing that the people who make, you know, that software is made by people. Right. And, um, by, you know, submitting issues that are like, this thing is broken, fix it. It's like, okay, like this thing is made by people. Like you don't (laughs) have to, you don't have to be mean. And I, I assume, I assume that that same sort of attitude comes up in customer support a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I can tell you it does, yes. Um, So now you have focused primarily on things that have a a web front end, and in some cases, uh, some pretty difficult stuff. So things that people, you know, can experience right now is uh, this work that you're doing on a P5 editor. I assume that there's a... Is it an active project? Does it actually have an editor going right now? It's an extremely active world. If anything, the processing community is continuing to grow in a way that's kind of unbelievable. It's funny if you um, if you talk to the the two creators of processing, Casey Casey Reese and Ben Fry. Mm-hmm. Um, it you know it had just like been been a thing that they worked on for a few a few years and they hadn't really done a ton of promotion and you know like they they hadn't been the the kind of like marketing people but had just like persistently worked on it and made it better and had kind of made made the rounds in academia i think now with p5 it's able to break out of those academic realms because it's a website because you know because it's a a web tool javascript is super popular and it's it's exploding in that way and i think i think also one of one of the board members of the foundation dan schiffman he has a youtube channel where he does he does processing and p5 videos right right and that has exploded i think he has like five hundred thousand subscribers or something it's it's wild that's unbelievable um, oh no, it's seven hundred fifty-three thousand. <laughs> you know, and you think about it, it's like, it's like a creative programming language. Nobody would have guessed there were seven thousand of those people. You know, there's as yeah. you mentioned before. You know, you don't even think of it as being a thing, really, but it's actually yeah. quite enormous. And I, I think I think also with all of these pushes for like we all need to learn how to program, right and that I think that attitude at least at least for me I like I hear that and I'm like why does everyone need to have <laughs> you know and I think I think there there's some reasons that are positive and I think there are some reasons that are malicious for me what I like about p5 and processing is that the goal isn't to for everyone to be a programmer. The goal is for everyone to understand this art form and understand their computers or understand technology. The, the, the term like technical literacy is thrown around more. And, and that to me makes, feels more um, uh, inclusive of the, the goal of that. I think this, this concept of everyone needs to learn how to program is coming from. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have to admit that sometimes I'm a, a little weirded out by by the everyone has to program thing. I, and I'm not sure if it's like everyone has to program so that we all can have jobs in the future or everyone mm-hmm. has to program so that we can make crueler working environments for people or yeah. whatever. But um, it seems like... I, I, I like this idea of technical literacy as being a better approach because if you think about it, if you think of a programming language as a tool, it makes sense for there to be some cabinet makers and some people that can hammer a nail in the wall to be able to hang up a picture. And I don't need to become a cabinet maker in order to hang a picture, but yeah. it's nice to be able to know how a hammer works in, in order to be able to decorate my room especially if I consider myself a decorator, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think that metaphor <clears throat> translates really well to this, right? Um, so in, in the sense, right, it's like learning, if you learn like a creative coding tool, it's, you know, it's not necessarily like you're going to take that and become a software developer. You could, 
maybe that's what you're interested in, but maybe you're just learning, for example, how images are represented as numbers on your computer, right? And right. that's that's important. That's an important thing to understand, like how how computers work, you know. And I, I think with with technical literacy, it not only extends to to you know like understanding a little bit of programming and like how that can help you in, in any anything that you're doing or any any job that you're doing, but also for example, under, understanding things like machine learning in the future and the the biases that exist in this, or understanding you know, web security and, and how corporations like doing, you know, taking our data, like everything with Facebook or, or whatever, yeah. you know, and I think that getting um, that technical literacy is a great goal for all, all these different, all these different spaces as well. Yeah. I think that's actually smart. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, on one hand you could say it helps you to be a better designer because you know what the raw materials of the work are kind of are, right? But yeah. also it prevents you from being a dupe. It prevents yeah. you from being taken advantage of by people who make claims that aren't real or that yeah. are malicious. Absolutely. You know, just like being able to understand, you know, for for example, I feel like the, this this to me is the canonical example of um, machine learning and bias, but the, the machine learning algorithm being used to assign um being used to assign bail, you know, understanding how that, what biases could exist in that is super important. To assign bail, you mean like I'm in jail and I want to get out bail? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, talk about things that I don't think about in my life. <laughs> Assigning <laughs> bail is one of them. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't even think of there being an algorithm, but of course there is. Yeah. It pulls from, you know, a years of data of judges assigning bail, but uh -huh. ob obviously that data is biased, sure. right? You know, and you know, the whole, the whole attitude that's, um, it's an algorithm, it's unbiased, you know, yeah. I, think, I think it's important to give people tools to understand these things. Right, right, indeed. Now, uh, one area I want to talk to you about that is fascinating and, and also surprisingly unknown really to me is the creative use of web technologies. I mean, that if, if there's anything that when I look across the breadth of your work is, is kind of almost ubiquitous, it's yeah. that, right? And I think for a lot of people, there's a breakdown in thinking about using, especially in a performative way of using, using web technology for performative work, simply because the second you start thinking about, hey, I can use web technology for stuff, you're you're thrown into this thing about like, oh, I had that one night when I was trying to watch a YouTube video and it froze and it cracked up and I hate web technology and it's never going to be performant, performant enough for me to perform with, right? But you are kind of like staking your, your whole career on the fact that it's like, well, there is ways to use this stuff. And Places where I've seen, you know, real successes are things, the things that you've done with Note for Max, the things that you're doing with, with the P5 stuff. And the first time I, I interacted with your work was, uh, was when, when you were doing things with the Mira stuff, which is the, um, the tablet to Max interface, which, I mean, that is a highly performant system that is, that kind of requires, a uh, a web interface of a sort and uh you've got that all working kind of really humming i mean how is it first of all that you were able to buy into the idea that this could be real and how do you sell that to other people as being a thing that's actually viable great question i think i i have i have two i have two thoughts about this so you know given given that um everyone, you know, everyone has a phone and everyone has, you know, so many people have computers and, and more people have phones than computers, right? And the thing that, that ties all of these devices together is a browser, right? So um, being able to use, use browser technology to make your, make your thing is extremely important. And by putting something on the internet, it's accessible to 
to everyone, to anyone that has a computer or phone or tablet or whatever. And the great, from a, from like a technical perspective, the great thing about making a browser application is that it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be native code, right? It doesn't have to be Swift or C sharp, or you don't have to write it in different ways for different platforms. You could just write it, just draw the script in it and it works everywhere. And that's, that's great. Another train of thought on this is if we, if we look back to the beginning of the internet, I would say, I think there, there was much more room for, or it was much more widely known, all the people who are making net art and stuff, right? You know, artists, artists like, um, like Corey Archangel, mm-hmm. who are making, making weird net art. And in some ways, maybe, maybe that community has stayed about the same size, but many more people are using the internet for their jobs, right? And using, using browser technologies for that, for their jobs. So it seems like a place that's more for doing work and, right. you know, people right. spend, spend their lives doing work. And for me as a, as a teenager, I went to the internet for fun. Like I went to play Neopets and like play flash games and, um, talk to my friends on the internet. You know, I think, I think for me, that's, that's been the, the starting place for, for this technology that that kind of like fun weird side and i think given that these technologies are, are more and more prominent and can reach a wide audience it's a great place to to throw throw your throw your stake in <laughs> sure right now one of the things so that i would think and, and it's funny because uh you go back to Neopets as kind of a, a really <laughs> uh, an important thing, but I think that there's something there because both Neopets and you also stated that like you had a MySpace page that you messed around with. And I remember back then customizing little game-like entities or customizing your MySpace page in particular was for a lot of people their entree into what is this HTML stuff? What is this CSS stuff? It was, it was the thing that kind of compelled you to figure out a little bit of the technology. And I feel (laughs) like in now in the days of Twitter and Facebook, that kind of configurable interface or configurable environment doesn't exist as much, right? It does not. And, um, and conversely, there also used to be a variety, more of a variety of tools that had widespread use. So you had flash slash shockwave and and some of these other things that maybe provided some easier entry paths especially flash because you could make a flash thing without coding just by basically animating stuff and um i feel like some of the options and some of the entry paths for people to get into creative internet-based art have kind of been pulled away absolutely I mean, it does feel that way to me. I know so many people who got into programming through Flash right. and you used Flash as, you know, to like make games and like animations and stuff on the internet. And that, that being pulled away was horrible, <laughs> you know, like truly, truly horrible. And um, there, yeah, it, do, it does feel like the fun places on the internet are, are going are going away. It's like, you know, all, all these different social media platforms are now, you know, it's like they're influencers and people who are making money, money on these, right. money on these things. And like, pre, you have to present in a certain way and, and whatever that's, it's less like, this is my, I think that the, the internet used to be, used to be a place for getting out of the world. Mm. And now, now it's shifted from the internet is the world. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and you like retreat away from that to like real life. <laughs> that's, real life. <laughs> that's actually a really, in- my middle son is, is a budding artist, right? And yeah. he spends a lot of his time in an, in internet groups where he's talking to other artists. And I see that then for him, the retreat to solitary is to turn off the phone and, and to take a pad of paper and draw. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it that way, but that actually is his the, the stuff he does on his phone is not his escape. That's yeah. the world. That's that's yeah. a really interesting perspective. I'd not thought about it that way, but it also it also comes off a little creepy, maybe. 
Yeah, it's it's weird for I think yeah, I think for me as as someone who remembers being a child and and not really having a computer like using a computer. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I guess I, I had one, but you know, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't the center of your world. It wasn't the center yeah. of my world. I used it to play games, and and that's about that's about it. Mm-hmm. And I I grew up and and like was part of that that shift. And yeah, it's it's interesting to me to see how that's changed because it's been so like so much part of my identity. Right now, part of part of using web technology also though is kind of having the browser be this ubiquitous landscape that your work can exist on. But now with the prevalence of of mobile phones as people's primary uh, computing platform, that kind of changes things too, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's important to make everything work on a phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do you how do you do that in in some kind of useful way though? I mean, you have to be grappling with that in a lot of different ways because uh certainly the stuff you do with Mira that's focused on on So you work on the browser part of the of the Mira thing, right? Is yes. that true? Right. Yes. Um so you have to make sure that that's operational on a browser. You certainly with P5. That's the whole focus of that. If you're working on the on the in browser editor, that's, yeah, that's well, your focus there too. But I mean, some of that stuff can't either can't or maybe you don't even want to work all that super well on a on a phone browser simply because the space isn't there to do anything useful. Or or am I just like old manning it to death right here? <laughs> no, I mean I. I'm continually surprised when people like as as of right now the P5 web editor doesn't work super great on phones but I'm surprised every time someone asks for it cuz for me like the screen is too tiny and I can't really imagine wanting to do programming right. and that's what people do and it's it's like a goal for me within within the next few months to to make the mobile experience better but i guess people want to want to do it and and there's there's also so many devices in between you know there's like tablets that people want to do programming on or in schools a lot of students have chromebooks oh i don't think it's even a lot of students anymore i my partner is a is a school teacher and um i can tell you that it has been a long time since they have bought anything other than a chromebook yeah. Simply because the management of those devices is easier, the cost is lower, and uh, at this point, Google gives them so much stuff that it's a no-brainer. Exactly, exactly. So, but it also a, puts some really great limit, you know, huge limits on the kind of technology you can offer people to play with. Absolutely, and who knows how good or bad it is to have one one company supplying. These devices in schools, something to think about. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, I know but, I have my opinion, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a complicated issue. Um, but if, if anything, it's, it's an important thing to think about. And it's important to make, make these tools work, work on Chromebooks, I right. guess. So now from, um, I'm, given your background and given the things that were important to you and given where those things took you, I'm mm-hmm. curious when people, you have probably got a lot of people who ask you, hey, Cassie, I or my son or my daughter is interesting, interested in getting into like making fun stuff, doing cool technology, but also creative technology stuff. What direction do you steer them? And what are the places where, you know, what would be the equivalent of like, you know, I had fun with Neopets or um, I played around with Flash. I mean, for you, is that is is the P5 world kind of the great entree point or does it depend on what kind of work they want to do? What, how do you use, how do you introduce people into tools and how do you help them decide the tools to get started on? Again, because you're kind of a polymath when it comes to tools. You, you got them all. So I'm curious how you make the decisions when you're introducing people to stuff. I mean, it, it really depends. In some ways, I don't know if this platform exists. 
I think the only the, for me the only thing that's coming to mind right now that's that's like an equivalent of Neopets is like the website DIY.com, which I which I think is is super great. But it's it's not necessarily a tool. It's like a platform, mm-hmm. and it really depends. You know, one one thing I like about P five and processing is that you learn coding syntax, whereas whereas like a tool like Scratch, you're not necessarily learning coding syntax and people like people using it can get really frustrated because it kind of feels like you're doing baby stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's for, for me, I think it's important to find this balance between it's easy to get into, but also you can, you're like learning a real skill. And and I think that's really true of processing in P5 and also, also max. I think, I think that's true. You're like really learning a real a real skill it doesn't it doesn't feel like baby stuff sure and so i i think that that's how i i usually i usually direct people is to tools that feel easy or have an have an entry point but also can have professional uses because i think i think that's really motivating yeah that makes a lot of sense absolutely well right because if nothing else you don't feel like this is going to be good for the first six months, then I'm going to have to find the real thing, right? Yeah. People, people struggle with that, especially, especially now with programming where there's so many different things to learn and um, so many different, different paths. It's like, okay, when am I going to learn this thing? And then I'm just going to throw out this knowledge because no one is using React anymore or, or whatever. That's, but that's one really cool thing about like processing and Max is that these tools are like still relevant. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and have crazy. been stable. I mean, believe me, you just, what you just said, which is like, oh, you know, nobody uses React anymore. I mean, that makes my stomach kind of drop out because now I've got a bunch of work that I've done in React. And this is like on work. Oh, no, people do use React. I just I, said I, that. No, I know, I know, but it's, <laughs> I recognize that. But what I'm saying is that's yeah. one of the things with sort of like putting your, your eggs in a basket with the technology is that we're in a time where also like, I mean, when I first started doing a lot of web technology stuff, re, like a recent version of it, it was like, oh, everybody's using Angular. So I jump in and I'm doing all kinds of stuff with Angular. And, and it was like in an eye blink, everyone's like, nobody's using Angular. You know? Yeah. And it's uh, it's a really funny world. And it's it's kind of hard to also, especially when you're talking about your creative life, to say, well, I'm going to put my... You know, I'm I'm gonna really put a lot of effort into this language, and then for it to disappear overnight is is very scary when you're basing your artistic work on it. Absolutely, and I think I think that's one of the the draws of these tools being open source right. is that there's more community control mm-hmm. over over these tools and less less of a feeling that they're just gonna disappear overnight. As expected, I have about two hours more of questions that I would love to ask you (laughs) because I feel like we've just started probing on some of these ideas and there's so much more to to do. And so I am definitely going to set you up to come back and talk more on on these things. But in the meantime, our time is up, so I'm going to have to let you go. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and uh, having this chat. It was really fantastic. Yeah, this has been fun. All right. Well, with that, I will let you go. Have a great one. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Many thanks to uh, Cassie for having that great chat. It was really fun to kind of throw back to some of uh, the old school ways of hackability in the net age. But it's also really interesting to hear about uh, a lot of her current work as well. If you're interested in seeing more of Cassie's work in action, you can check out uh, the P5 project. That's p5js.org. Uh, they have the web editor available right from the front page there. Um, additionally, you can uh, check out her work with the Mirror Web Project. Or also, uh, if you come to the Cycling 74 Expo, Cassie will be giving a workshop on using the node for Max uh, functionality, which is probably one, along with the MC system, one of the most important parts of the 
Max 8 update. So in any case, Cassie's all over the place doing great stuff. Check out her work. If you come to Expo, you can check out a workshop with her. And in all, uh, I want to thank her again. I want to thank you for listening and have a great day. We'll catch you later.